Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Booth mentioned the weather we've certainly been enjoying this week. Hope you've all had a, had a chance to as well. We live in a very response-oriented culture that is driven by consuming inputs from multiple sources and then reacting to those inputs. The priorities of society in general, the priorities of politics, the priorities of businesses, and our priorities as individuals are often driven not by the goals that we have chosen to pursue, but rather by the things that we feel compelled to react to. The Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary defines a reaction in the sense that we are discussing as a response to some treatment, situation, or stimulus. Another source, dictionary.com, defines reaction as an action in response to some influence or event. Reactions can be generated in response to both internal and external stimuli, or a combination of both. In many cases, it can be difficult to discern whether a particular reaction is driven more internally or externally. Unfortunately, the societal weaknesses and imbalances in our culture have led us further and further into the problematic path of being influenced not merely by a reactive mindset, but often by what are in reality overreactions to things that influence our lives. Merriam-Webster defines an overreaction as responding to something with too strong an emotion or with unnecessary or excessive action. Sadly, overreacting has become so common in the public sphere that it's kind of just the status quo now, a default mode of operation reacting and overreacting to things that we largely can't control generates a lot of distraction in our lives. Another season of God's festivals is rapidly approaching, and unfortunately, we're slogging through a year in which the many distractions that we already faced before in life have increased by a whole order of magnitude. So how can we avoid the default outcome of allowing our focus and priorities to be determined for us? How can we resist allowing the trajectory of our lives to be driven by reaction, overreaction, and the resulting distractions from what's truly important? In the time that we have remaining, let's understand how one of Jesus Christ's key instructions on setting the course of our lives can bring the directional guidance that will prevent us from wandering off course spiritually and help us reach the destination of God's kingdom. If we start with that premise that God's kingdom is the ultimate goal that we are working toward, then that provides an immediate sense of direction in itself. In contrast, not setting that as our destination or striving for some lesser one both guarantee that we won't reach it. As the well-known saying attributed to the author and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar goes, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Another humorous but very profound observation in the same line of thought from the author Robert Brault is that, quote, when you are going in circles, it is not progress to report a sharp increase in circles completed. Anyone who's ever worked in an office environment can probably relate to that. You might have already guessed the specific instruction from our Savior that we'll be focusing on. It's found in Matthew 6, Matthew 6, in the first portion of verse 33, where Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. Right now is a very good time to be thinking about pursuing God's kingdom above all else in our lives. 
Again, if we accept and internalize God's kingdom as the destination, then the two key words relative to our choices here are seek and first. The word seek is the Greek zeteo from Strong's Concordance. It could also be translated as desire, endeavor, or inquire for. The word first is the Greek proton from the New Testament Greek lexicon at BibleStudyTools.com. Its implication is first in rank, influence or honor, of chief or principal importance. It's meaningful to note that in this passage from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' instruction was about the relative importance of God's kingdom as compared with all the other priorities in our lives, and specifically those things that tend to cause anxiousness or worry within us. With respect to the difficulties of life that tend to automatically be slotted up at the top of our emotional and mental energy consumption lists, Jesus said that the answer is not focusing narrowly on or within those challenges, but broadly and beyond them to life's ultimate purpose. The last half of verse 33 states that when we set our hearts on the coming reign of God and his complete righteousness, the very real needs and challenges of this life that understandably cause distress and discomfort for us sometimes will be addressed as well. Now just to be clear, the addressing of our needs can often take many forms that may or may not align with what we had hoped for or envisioned. The Holman Christian Standard Bible has the last portion of verse 33 as all these things, again, in the context, the things that we tend to worry about, quote, will be provided for you. The wording here reminds us and refocuses us on the reality in our thinking that God is our provider. Again, we know that God's responses to what we request or hope for may be a bit different than what we were thinking, but God promises nevertheless to provide based on his understanding of our needs. There is danger, as mentioned at the beginning, with undue influence on our thinking from reactions and overreactions and distractions. The problem is that they move our focus really in the wrong direction toward things that don't contribute to achieving our most important priorities and the most meaningful things in our lives. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we already struggle with putting too much focus even on the genuine needs and difficulties in our lives. The distractions that we wind up embroiled in based on reactionary thinking place our focus largely on preferences and opinions, which is even further into unhelpful territory and inevitably pits us against one another. The fruits of this are all around us in the disconnection, the chronic disagreement, and the outright hostility that are permeating just about every sphere of society. And it can be very disheartening, but thankfully for us as God's people, there is still a clear and effective method to counteract these negative forces in both our personal and collective lives. That method is to earnestly pursue God's kingdom as the highest ranked priority in our physical and emotional and spiritual lives. So what are some tangible ways that we can focus on giving God's kingdom that highest rank of influence and importance in our lives? We'll look at two. First is to specifically include God's kingdom in our Bible reading and prayer. Specifically include God's kingdom in our Bible reading and prayer. Reading the Bible and praying form the foundation of our relationships with God the Father and Jesus Christ as the primary method for listening to and talking with them. So if we want to make the kingdom a true 
priority in our lives, then it must be a priority in what we communicate about with the ones who will establish it. God's plan to establish the kingdom here on earth is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. But there are, of course, areas of the scriptures where it is in more specific focus. These are good areas to invest a bit more of our focus in as well, especially during the feast seasons that picture and explain the major milestones in God's plan. In the same Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gave the instruction to seek God's kingdom first, he also specifically said that it should be a key element of our prayers. Let's look at Matthew 6, starting in verse 9. Matthew 6, verse 9, where Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And of course, the meaning of this instruction is not simply that we remember to mention the coming kingdom in our prayers, but that we fervently crave the reality of it. The Young's literal translation has verse 10 as, Thy reign come. Reign meaning authority of rule. Thy will come to pass. So far beyond a vague idea of a better time than now, we have to yearn for everything in this world, including our own character, to be different, with the key differentiator being conformance to God's will in ways that aren't fully possible in this life. When we pray for that kingdom to come, it will profoundly change the focus of our lives. The second way that we can give God's kingdom the highest rank in our lives is to evaluate our thoughts and actions with a kingdom filter. Evaluate our thoughts and actions with a kingdom filter. The author Robert Brault makes the profound observation that we should, quote, occasionally ask, what is the connection between what I want most in life and anything I plan to do today. If we asked ourselves that question more often, it would likely result in some, some, in some substantial changes in daily routine for most of us. What do I want most in life, and how is it connected to what I'm going to do today? Now, we should qualify, of course, there are lots of mundane things that, yes, we have to do. We have to go to school, to work, the diapers have to be changed, the groceries have to be bought. Those things have their own place in our character development. But in the discretionary time, what are the things we want most? And how do they connect with what we choose to do? In the parable of the minas recorded in Luke's gospel, Jesus illustrated the personal commission that we've been given as God's servants. I'd like to read this from the English Standard Version as the wording is clear with respect to our topic here. So Luke chapter 19, I'll read verses 12 and 13 and 15 from the English Standard Version. It says, He, Jesus, said, Therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. In the spiritual application of this verse, the minas given represent spiritual gifts and ability and potential. The minas gained represent the godly character that we are expected to be pursuing and developing over the course of our lives. The Nelson Study Bible's comments on verse 15 explains the clear implications of what we must all anticipate when God's plan to establish his kingdom at the return of his son comes to pass. It says, quote, having returned with authority to rule, the nobleman asked the servants to give an account of their labor in his absence. We are 
those servants. And when the time comes to give an account of our spiritual character, the need to filter our thoughts and actions based on whether they bring us closer in alignment to or further in alignment from God's kingdom will be very evident, which is all the more reason to make use of that filter a habit now and use it to help avoid the reactions, overreactions, and distractions that can so easily consume much of this life. So in conclusion then, I'd like to read Matthew 6, 33, and verse 34 as well from the New English translation, which helps bring out the practical application we've discussed here. Matthew 6, 33 from the New English translation says, but above all, Pursue his kingdom and righteousness and all these things, again, the needs and context that we tend to become anxious over, will be given to you as well. Verse 34, so then, do not worry about tomorrow. And we might read in about the reactions, the overreactions, the distractions. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. Especially as this incredible season of God's feasts approaches, let's focus on pursuing his kingdom as the highest ranking and most influential priority in our lives.